have our next speaker, John Spiegman, from, who's coming to us from China. Yeah. Great. So I'd like to uh, thank the speakers, uh, <laughs> the speakers, the organizers for inviting me to come and uh, speak to you today, <laughs> and all the speakers as well. So uh, as you can see from this conversation, there's a huge appetite at the moment for a shortcut to get to a healthy, longer life. And the problem is there's never going to be any randomized controlled trials. Uh, so these kind of drugs pose a real problem. And um, we're always going to have to rely on animal experiments. So there is a, a gold standard for doing lifespan work, and that's the intervention testing program in the USA. And uh, this program started about 20 years ago. So far, they've completed 70 tests, got 31 in progress. And 19 of those tests have, have been positive, but they've only concerned five five actual compounds that have come out positive, and three of those only worked in males. On the other hand, we can screen enormous numbers of compounds in lower organisms like worms and flies. And we have this thing going on at the moment with Aura Bi Biomedical, who are planning to screen a million compounds in worms for longevity effects. But there's a, a big problem with this sort of process, and that is that the translation from worms to mice isn't very good. So there was a speaker at the Dublin Longevity Summit just a couple of weeks ago who pointed out that 75% of drugs that work in mice work in worms. But actually, that's completely the wrong way to think about it. And the best way I can explain this is if we think about heroin addicts and young kids drinking milk. So if you have a heroin addict, there's a very, very strong chance that that heroin addict drunk milk when they were a kid. So predicting in that direction from heroin addict to drinking milk, it's really easy. It's almost 100%. But you can't take that number of 100% to work the other way. So knowing that a kid drinks milk tells you nothing about whether they're going to be a heroin addict when they grow up. And so this is the same with mouse work and worm work, that you can't take that 75% number and work it the other way. And in fact, if we look at, there was a review in Gerasage just recently that showed that 38 drugs that were tested that work in worms, none of them translated to mice. So actually the translation rate is probably less than 2%. It, the real problem is just the numbers. You know, if you screen a million compounds and you get hits on 0.1% of them, that's still a thousand potential compounds. So the question is, given those thousand potential compounds, how do you find the 20, the 2% that are going to work in mammals? At so the current rate of testing by the intervention testing program, it would take 220 years to find those 20 targets. So obviously that's not quick enough. And the way I kind of think about this is it, it's kind of like trying to get across a river. So at one side of the river, we have these screening targets of worms and flies. And then we have this huge gap that we have to get across to mammalian work and non-human primates and finally drugs that will extend life and health span. And so it seems that it would be really advantageous if there was some sort of biomarker in mouse that would be really useful. We could do short-term mouse experiments to screen out what's worth going for in, in a full lifespan work. But the problem is, what, what would we do? What, what would we measure? What would be the best biomarker to measure? And of course, everybody's got their own favorite. And most of these are kind of inconvenient because they're too specific or it takes too much of the lifespan before they actually are able to discriminate. So what I mean there is, if you take something like DNA damage, if it takes 24 months of the life of a mouse to get a difference in DNA damage, you may as well do the longevity screen because you're almost there anyway. 
So what we really need is something that you can measure in a mouse that's only, say, five to eight months old, and it will tell you how long that mouse is going to live. But that's, that's the sort of thing I've been thinking about. So many of you will have heard of this guy, Owen Schrodinger. He's famous for three things. He uh, invented weight mechanics and quantum theory, for which he won the Nobel Prize. He's also very famous for uh, this idea of a cat in a box that's neither dead or alive. Uh, but he also uh, had a sort of dark side to his life. So uh, it turned out after he was dead that he uh, spent a lot of time abusing young girls. But I think there is another positive point to his life, and that is he wrote a book in 1944 called What is Life? And this was based on, and during the war, he, he was an Austrian, he fled Austria, he went to Ireland, and while he was in Ireland, he gave some lectures in Cambridge, and this book is based on those lectures. And basically in that book, what he says is that life is a low entropy state, and what it needs is a constant flow of energy to stop that entropy increasing within the system. And aging happens as entropy increases, because we only protect ourselves from entropy increase as long as it's evolutionary advantageous. So as long as we, we have some reproductive potential, we will protect ourselves. But once we've reproduced, we're kind of disposable and we just kind of fall apart slowly. And that, that increasing entropy is the reason that we age, and ultimately the entropy gets so big that, that we die. And some people uh, do that quicker than others. And what we're all kind of interested in in this room is uh, declining the rate of entropy accumulation so that we live longer and healthier. So if that idea is correct, then what we need are drugs that slow down the rate of entropy accumulation. So that, that was a good idea, I think. So the question then is, how do you measure entropy accumulation? And the first step of doing that is actually really easy. What you do is you go and find some people who know about entropy and ask them what to do. And that's what I did. So I found these guys who work at Edicap University in Istanbul. And uh, the next step is more complex because what you have to do then is build a thermodynamic model of the mouse. And you have to measure all sorts of uh, things that are exchanging within that model in order to estimate something. Uh, most of you will have heard of energy, of course, but um, probably a lot of you have not heard of this thing called exergy. So exergy is the potential to do work. So a system has a certain amount of exergy. Some of it is realized and some of it is not realized, and the bit that's not realized is called exergy destruction, and entropy is related to exergy destruction. So of course these are physicists, and so there's a lot of horrendous equations that you have to look at, but actually, uh, despite its complexity or apparent complexity, it's actually a pretty simple idea. So there are only two key equations that you need to think about here. This is the first one that defines ecstasy destruction. And it's, it's actually pretty simple. So the left-hand term is the incoming exergy from food intake, and then subtracted from that are various other things. So the second term is the exergy that's exported in things like urea and things like that. And then there's the exergy in heat production, and then there's the productive work, which is internal and external work. And what you're left with is exergy destruction. So it's actually pretty simple. It's a really complex looking equation, but it's actually not really complex. And exergy destruction is directly related to entropy generation. So that's fine. We, we have a sort of model there of what to do. The question is, how do we parameterize that model? And actually, we'd already done an experiment uh, on graded calorie restriction. And what we'd done is we'd taken mice uh, fed ad libitum either 24 hours a day or 12 hours a day, and then we had various levels of restriction up to 40%. And we did two experiments, one of which was 
to take mice that are five months old and restrict them for three months. And the other experiment was, was a much longer experiment. And I'm just going to focus on this three-month experiment because that's what we want to do. We want to try and predict entropy generation in these animals at that age to see whether we can predict how long they should live. And we also did some work on protein restriction because if you fix the protein level and put animals on restriction, you end up uh, also protein restricting them. So a question arises, is it really calories or is it protein that's driving it? And so what we did was we uh, created a whole set of new diets with 18, 16, 14, 12% protein in to get the equivalent levels of protein restriction without calorie restriction. And in all these mice, on all, on all these different levels, we, we actually did um, a massive amount of phenotyping. So actually from this experiment that only included about 60 animals, we've already had 20 papers on the way that they respond. But in fact, all we need to know in terms of exergy destruction and entropy are the things that are relatively easily measured if, if very time consuming. And so uh, I'll just give you an idea of the sort of richness of this data. So this is the body weight trajectories. You can see at baseline, they're all pretty close together. We stick them on these different diets, they fan out and after about 30 days, they reach a new level of stability that's related to the level of restriction. There are dramatic changes in metabolic rate, and there's also big changes in body temperature. We've measured the uh, body composition at the whole animal level at different time points, but also at the end of the experiment, we've taken the animals apart and looked at the size of every single organ in the body and how that's changed by the process of restriction. And most things get smaller, the brain gets smaller, for example, under calorie restriction, but some things don't get smaller. So all the intestine, for example, is completely protected. And in fact, the stomach gets, gets bigger. So we can combine all that knowledge together and stick it into all those little equations and finally end up with a number for what the entropy generation is. And what we find is that uh, as you go from 24 ad libitum feeding through time restricted feeding through different levels of restriction, then uh, entropy generation declines and the work output also declines. But if you look at protein restriction, there's no trend in entropy generation at all. So the question then is how do we convert the entropy generation rate into a lifespan prediction? And, and the big problem there is, of course, that we don't know the level of entropy at which the animals die, but we can infer that from the 24 ad lib group. So if we take a median lifespan of 720 days for a 24 ad lib fed C57 mouse. The entropy generation rate we've just measured at 0.13 kilojoules per degree Kelvin per day. And then the lifetime entropy accumulation for those mice is 74 kilojoules per degree Kelvin. And so if entropy generation falls to 0.08, then we can predict that mouse would live for 925 days. What do we have to compare that to? Because of course these mice, we've killed them and cut them to bits. And one sort of bad thing about this sort of field is that you can't like put the animals back together and say, okay, now, now go and tell me how long you're gonna live. So we have to use other experiments to do that. And this is a, a summary of all the calorie restriction studies on rodents that I could find up to 2016. And you can see there's a lot of variability here. And a lot of that probably is related to uh, the factors that we were told about the other day by that uh, really nice talk by Acosta Rodriguez uh, about timing and things like that. But generally, the more restriction you have, the longer you live. And so we can overlay on that our levels of restriction and look at what the expected lifespan effects are. The effect of protein restriction is uh, much smaller. So generally, less protein you eat, the more life you get if you're a mouse. Uh, but we can then overlay on that what we expect to happen in relation to protein restriction. And then we can compare these two predictions. So we have the predictions from the empirical data and we have the predictions 
from the entropy accumulation. And what we can see is that the entropy prediction is, is pretty good. I mean, so the R squared is 0.88. Entropy prediction is always optimistic. And the reason for that is because we take a very simple assumption. So we make a measurement at a single time point, and we assume that it's linear, whereas we actually know it's probably a curve. And so what that happens is we just extrapolate out, and that means that entropy accumulation is always uh, too high. So the real problem is that that doing all that's an awful lot of work, and so it's not much easier to do than just doing a lifespan screen. So one question we kind of had was, can we just measure a couple of things and get close? If we could do that, that would be great. And one of the key parameters in this exergy destruction calculation is body temperature. And, and I was particularly interested in that because we'd just done some work on body temperature that we published uh, a couple of years ago. So under calorie restriction, there are parallel changes in metabolic rate and body temperature. And so what we were interested was, could we dissociate those effects on lifespan? What's causing the lifespan change in a calorie restricted mouse? Is it the change in body temperature or is it the change in metabolic rate? And so to do that, you need a situation where body temperature is changing in a different way from metabolism. So if you look at the relationship between metabolic rate and ambient temperature, then this is the sort of standard curve called the Schlander curve. And we can put on that what happens to body temperature. And what happens here is if you measure a mouse at 21 degrees, you get these measurements for body temperature at metabolic rate. But if you make them warm and put them at 32 and a half degrees, then what happens is you get a decrease in the metabolic rate at the same time that you get an increase in temperature. So then you can dissociate what the effects are. And so we did an experiment in collaboration with a guy called George Zijun from Wenzhou University. And what we wanted to do was uh, do it in, we did it in uh, male and female mice from this Swiss strain of mice, but we also did it in hamsters just to give some sort of uh, more generalizability of it. And what we did was we kept mice and hamsters under three conditions. We kept them at room temperature of 21 degrees. We kept them in hot temperatures of 32 and a half degrees. And then Joe had this really great idea, and that is to put a little fan in, inside the cage. And that's a really cool idea because uh, what happens when you put the fan in the cage is that you change the position of that line. And so what happens is at 32 and a half degrees, you move the positions of uh, those two points that are really close together. And the metabolic rate is unchanged with the wind, uh, but the body temperature drops. And so you can actually and do a really nice separation there of what's going on. So what happens then, this is the impact on energy expenditure. Hot rodents have lower metabolic rate. There's a very small impact at the wind, but it's not significant. So just exactly like we predicted from the model. What happens to body temperature? It goes the opposite way. So hot rodents have higher body temperature, but as we predicted, when you blow wind on them, you get rid of that effect. And so the real question then is what happens to lifespan? If body temperature mediates the lifespan effect, then mice in hot conditions will live shorter and the wind will reverse that effect. But if metabolic rate is the reason, then mice in hot conditions will live longer and the wind will reverse that effect. And what happens is really, really clear. So rodents in the heart have shorter lifespans and blowing wind on them gets rid of that condition. And it's the same whether they're mice or hamsters or whether they're males or females. And so this fairly conclusively shows that body temperature, not metabolic rate, is mediating that link to lifespan. So uh, those data show that increasing body temperature shortens life. It doesn't necessarily mean that the opposite thing, if you decrease body temperature, would extend life. But there's this really nice experiment that Bruno Conti did uh, where he overexpressed uncoupling protein in the area of the brain that senses temperature. 
And the mice therefore thought they were overheating and compensated by reducing their peripheral body temperature. And those mice live longer. So we have it in both directions now. Getting hot makes you live shorter. Staying cold makes you live longer. So if we combine 24-hour body temperature profiles with other easily measured components, then we can do a sort of shortcut entropy screening, which is much more efficient. And with the system we currently have, we could screen about one compound a week. But if we had increased capacity, we could screen about five compounds a week. So what that means is that if you take these thousand potential compounds from the Aura screen, then uh, we could potentially go through those in about four or five years and select out which ones would be the best ones to go into the uh, intervention testing program. So this is where I said we, we're at at the moment. I'd like to think about it like this, that we can fill in the stepping stones to get across that huge gap that's there at the moment and uh, allow us to develop something that will have an effect on lifespan. And I'll just finish uh, with a slide of all the people that I have the great pleasure to work with and also my fantastic collaborators from Wenjo and from Editep. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>